Continuing on with the TNCC Library Virtual Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to welcome Gordon T. Belt. Gordon is the Director of Public Services for the Tennessee State Library and Archives, where he leads the Library and Archives Reference and Research Section, facilitating public access to state historical collections and government records, and leading public outreach initiatives. Gordon has a lot, excuse me, Gordon has a, had a lifetime passion for Tennessee history and has worked in special collection libraries and archives in the volunteer state since 1995. Gordon received his master's degree in history in 2003 with a concentration in archival administration from Middle Tennessee State University and a bachelor's degree in political science in 1994 from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He is a past president of the Society of Tennessee Archivists and holds memberships in the Society of American Archivists, National Council on Public History, and the Tennessee Historical Society. He's also a published author. His latest book is John Seaver. Did I pronounce that correct, Gordon? Seaver? John Sevier. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Ten Tennessee's first hero was published by the History Press, examines the extraordinary life of Tennessee's first governor through the lens of history and memory. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Gordon T. Belt. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about the library and archives with you. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen here, so bear with me for one moment. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the library and archives. And um, I know I'm speaking to folks in Nevada, but um, a lot of Tennesseans have uh, migrated uh, west. And I don't know if I have any Tennesseans in the audience, but uh, uh, we're a state that borders eight different states. And we have a lot of uh, folks who come here and then leave. and um, their ancestors did the same, and so uh, we have a lot of interest in the genealogy and the resources in our uh, collection from all over the country, and so I'm honored to be with you here today. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what we'll cover today in this presentation. Um, first, I'm gonna give you a brief history of our library and archives, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, our collections and services. And then I want to take you on a sneak peek or a virtual tour of our new building under construction at the uh, Bicentennial Capitol Mall in downtown Nashville, something we're really excited about, and uh, you'll get to hear more about that. And then uh, I'm going to give you an overview of our online resources uh, you'll be able to use. And if there's time at the end, um, we can certainly answer any questions you may have. Uh, and uh, I can uh, pull up the website if, if need be and uh, do a live demo on some things if, if that's of interest to you. So uh, let's get started. So we're currently located in Nashville on the west side of the state capitol building. And uh, our current building, which you see in the slide here, was constructed in 1952, and it opened to the public in 1953. Our building is on the register, National Register of Historic Places, and it was built as a memorial to Tennessee's World War II veterans who had served in that war. And uh, we have a World War I memorial uh, at Legislative Plaza, which is uh, rather close, and this building serves as our World War II memorial. We are only, uh, I believe, seven states to have both its library and archive in the same facility. Um, most states have their library and archive in separate facilities uh, in different uh, locations. We feel like having the library and archives together in the same building allows us to serve the public better, brings all the collections under one roof, and also allows our librarians and archivists to uh, collaborate more closely and uh, be able to serve the neat research needs of our patrons. And so um, we're really pleased to be able to uh, do that. Customer service is a, a, a very important part of our mission and what we do. And so if you visit us online or if you visit us in person, our, our goal is to serve you. So, and this is one of the ways we do that through pro public programming. Now, a little bit of the history lesson here. We actually began as an institution in 1855, 
And we were, quote unquote, a gentleman's library exclusively for the legislature. So unfortunately, no women were allowed uh, to browse the collection at that time. Today, of course, we're open to everyone. Um, but over the course of our history, our collection and our focus has centered around Tennessee history and state government records. We also house a number of manuscript collections donated from individuals or groups. And this gives us a broad range of research material related to the history of our state. Now, uh, originally our institution was located in uh, the old Davidson County Courthouse building. But about a century ago, we moved into what is now called, um, in our state capital, the legislative lounge of the state capital. This slide you're seeing right now is that room, the, what's now known as the legislative lounge, but it was one time the Tennessee State Library. That beautiful iron staircase that you see here, um, that still exists. Uh, of course, many of the books are now in our collection in our building. Portraits are, uh, I believe, at the State Museum. Um, but uh, this area in the state capitol served as our official state library for many, many years until about the early 1950s. By, that, by the late 40s and early 50s, um, we began to consider uh, expanding our, our uh, footprint. And essentially, uh, we were bursting at the seams, much as we are today. Um, the collections grew. We acquired more material from donors, but more significantly, uh, as a repository of state government records, um, state government continued to provide us with the wealth of material, and we simply ran out of room in the state capital. And so uh, construction uh, was authorized and we began building our new building, which is where we are located today. You can see the construction photo here. And also uh, this fellow here uh, uh, supervising uh, the move of uh, historic materials into the, the building. And this is what the finished building looked like um, right after the uh, opening, 1953. And uh, not much has changed, the landscape perhaps, but uh, the building remains uh, the same footprint. Um, you can see this overhead shot, our proximity to the state capitol. And we're located right next to the state Supreme Court building, uh, which is another historic structure. Now, we are home to a wealth of material I've put on the slide here a brief summary of what you might expect to find at the Library and Archives. And um, obviously our books are, are a huge part of that. The picture you see here is our, our Tennessee room, our main research room on the south wing of the building. This is where um, you would come in if you're a visiting researcher to do your research. Um, and then of course we have our microfilm room uh, and legislative history, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But um, we're home to over 682,000 books, more than 5,000 maps, over a million photographs. Of course, we uh, house state government records, the governor to the legislature to the state agencies that uh, generate our records, service of our citizens. Uh, those records ultimately land in our building. We're also home to the Tennessee Library for Accessible Books and Media. And so that uh, arm of the Library and Archives serves citizens with vision or reading impairment. And our building also serves as the headquarters for our state regional library system. And in addition, we have been fortunate to have a longstanding re relationship with the Tennessee Historical Society. And so we house many of their collection in our, our building. And so that um, is a huge boon for researchers interested in Tennessee history. Now, we have um, what is probably the largest collection of Tennessee newspapers on microfilm that you will find anywhere. Uh, there are a lot of efforts going on um, to digitize these records. 
but uh, the vast majority of newspapers in small towns across Tennessee have not been digitized. They are on microfilm and we have them. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, begun, well, actually starting um, in 2012 when I first started working uh, as director of public services, we began expanding our technology in, in the microfilm reading room. Uh, we originally had two of these ScanPro um, units here, uh, and most of our microfilm readers were the traditional uh, analog um, point-operated uh, microfilm readers. But we've moved forward in technology, and we have about 16 of these now. And if you are a visiting researcher and you want to scan the newspapers or any other records we have on microfilm, Bring your flash drive because you can uh, uh, scan these uh, records to your heart's content and there's no, no charge for that service. A lot of times people will come in and, and not realize that this is a service that we provide and so we allow you to purchase a uh, flash drive from us at cost. So we're not allowed to make a profit as a government agency so we, we sell these at our cost as a service to you. And so um, if you're in Nashville and you're researching uh, your family history in Tennessee um, and you forget your flash drive, we'll have them for you. So just keep that in mind. But we not only have a wide variety of newspapers, but we have manuscript collections on microfilm, uh, vital records, of course, uh, transferred to our office. Um, and so we have those. We have 95 counties in the state of Tennessee and all. Uh, Almost all the counties, not all, but most of them have um, either an archive or a record center. And um, we have microfilmed a, a lot of those records. And so if your ancestor has traveled from one county to the ne next and you're trying to trace um, the evidence of those travels uh, in the documents left behind, you could go to each county seat and do that but you could also come to the library and archives and find that material on microfilm. So uh, this is a huge part of our collection. We're really proud of it. Now, we're working to digitize material every day, and we do that um, through the Tennessee Virtual Archive. And I'll, I'll talk about that resource a little bit later in the, in the presentation, but I want to give you kind of a visual of some of the scanning equipment that we use to um, digitize some of our material. Uh, this is just one piece of the um, puzzle here. This large format scanner we use to scan maps and uh, large format documents, um, ledger books and the sort. And um, ultimately, uh, those land on the Tennessee Virtual Archive. And so this is a, this is a place where we can uh, put our um, more visually interesting items on our on our uh, website, and um, I'll I'll go through that site um, a little bit later. But you can see the the web address down there. You can also reach the Tennessee Virtual Archive through our homepage, which you'll see um, in the presentation. Now, the division or the uh, section that I lead, the public services section. Uh, we serve as the liaison between uh, our collection and the public. And so what we do is we facilitate access to our important historical records and published resources. And uh, so we're really the, the, the first people you meet after you check in. And uh, we're here to serve you. And so uh, whether you're researching with us in person or online or over the phone, um, we're usually your first point of contact, and so um, we're very happy to be able to uh, direct you to our resources that we have. We serve a variety of uh, folks, primarily genealogists and family historians. I would estimate about 85% of the folks who um, contact us are interested in their family history, and so that's a huge part of what we do. Uh, but we also serve another, uh, uh, several other constituencies. Um, we have a legislative history area where uh, we serve the uh, members of the General Assembly and their staff, uh, attorneys and journalists interested in how state law works and uh, 
we have a really robust uh, program where we uh, have recorded the audio of the legislative sessions and their subcommittees. And so people interested in how uh, our government works and the history behind certain laws can come to us and find that information through our legislative uh, history unit through public services. We also serve employees of the state government and also uh, our regional library system. Uh, we help county archives and archivists uh, through grants and grant programs. And uh, we have an education outreach program as well that where we help students and teachers learn more about Tennessee history. Members of the media, authors, historians, and, and the general public, anyone with an interest in, in Tennessee history and our collections are welcome. Now, I want to give you um, a, a sneak peek at, at something that's really exciting that uh, we have going on in Nashville for the State Library and Archives. And I'll preface this by saying that um, our plans, um, as, as everyone's plans have been sort of derailed by, um, by events in, in the country, ours has as well. Um, more significantly for our um, construction of our new building, um, we had some uh, rather serious tornadoes um, tear through Tennessee in early March. And one of them landed in a, a community called Germantown uh, in nearby um, Nashville. And uh, it did a little bit of damage to our construction site. And so that delayed construction of our new building. We'll talk about that. We're back on track and we're really excited about it. And the reason for our new building is, of course, the same reason we had back in the late 40s and early 50s. We are bursting at the seams. Uh, our building was built uh, at, during the Cold War and was built in such a way that you cannot expand its walls. Uh, and we have filled it. And so uh, we have petitioned the legislature and the governor for many, many years to allow us to build a new building. And, uh, over the last few years, through the leadership of our uh, Secretary of State, Trey Hargett, we were able to convince the legislature and uh, the governor that this was a, a, a need and, and they helped fulfill that need. So we're really excited about the future on the Bicentennial Mall. And so our timeline, uh, as of now, um, looks like we're going to be opening to the public in April of 2021. We'll still be open in our current location serving patrons uh, up until the end of the year. And then um, by the end of the year in early January, we will begin taking over um, the new facility and moving material there. Now, I'll give you a few highlights. We're located on three and a half acres on the corner of the Bicentennial Capitol Mall and uh, we will have uh, about 165,000 square feet of, um, of space for our uh, collections and programming. We're really excited about this for a lot of reasons. Um, it allows us to expand our collections, um, house more material, but also serve our, the needs of our citizens better. In our current building, we have uh, an, a room in our fifth floor we call affectionately call the auditorium, but it's not much of an auditorium space. It's more or less a, a large office that can house about 50 or so people. This new building will allow us to house many, many more and uh, with multiple rooms and breakout rooms. And so uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to host a wide array of events and um, once the COVID-19 situation has resolved uh, and we're back into a normal service capacity, we'll be able to offer that uh, to our patrons after the grand opening. Um, and so we, we have, as part of this building, this is a rendering of what the new building will look like. And it's a pretty close um, rendering to what you'll see down there. Construction, uh, as I said, was delayed somewhat by the tornadoes. and and, and a little bit by COVID-19, but more so the tornadoes. Um, but we're back on track, as I said, and the C-shaped building uh, with the courtyard is, is quite beautiful and has three levels. Uh, and uh, the first level will be exhibit space. 
second level are collections, uh, public services, and then the third level uh, are archival technical services, library technical services are located up there. And here's an overhead view of what you can expect. Um, to put things in perspective, our new state museum, which opened, uh, I believe, last year or the year before, um, is located just opposite of this TriStar that I'm, I'm pointing out here on this side. And so this is really going to be a really nice hub for Tennessee history. Uh, for those that don't know, the Bicentennial Capitol Mall uh, was uh, completed during our bicentennial uh, as a state uh, in 1996. And so it depicts the history of our state um, from its early geological origins all the way to 1996. And um, you'll, you'll see a lot, you'll see a history timeline there. Uh, and of course the State Museum is there and now our building. So um, if you're in Nashville, it's definitely worth a visit. Now here are some interior renderings of our new building. Um, and so we'll have vastly more space to uh, be able to uh, assist uh, our, our researchers, more exhibit and classroom space. And one of the things that I'll point out is that uh, we will have parking. Um, many folks who visit us, we don't get very many complaints, but the one complaint we do get is that we do not have adequate parking. We have about 13 parking spaces on the perimeter of our current building. And uh, if we're full up, you have to uh, walk from a paid parking lot to get to us. And that's not fun when you're walking up a hill. This building has an underground parking garage dedicated to staff and to the public. So uh, you don't have to worry about folks parking in a spot and just taking off and wandering around somewhere else. Everybody who's parked there has a reason for being there. And so that. That's going to be a real boon to researchers because I know it, it, it's actually quite amusing. You, you tell people you're going to be able to house more collections and they're more excited about the parking than anything else. But uh, uh, we're excited about that too. A, a boon to us. Now, one feature of this new building uh, that allows us to expand is this uh, robotic retreat retrieval system, the ASRS. This is in a number of libraries across the country. I believe the University of Louisville has one. Utah Library has one. And what this allows us to do is um, place collections in these pack storage bins. And since everything we have in our collection is barcoded or will be barcoded, our computer system will be able to locate that item and uh, retrieve it and deliver it to our archivist who's waiting, and then we can deliver it to you. One really neat feature of this will be if you are researching and you plan a visit, you can, from the comfort of your home, pull up our online catalog. Um, you can't do it currently, but when we open, you'll be able to do this. Pull up our catalog, request a collection, and have that pulled in advance of your visit, and uh, when you arrive the next day, it will be uh, ready for you. So that, that's something new that uh, we're really excited about, and um, we're, we're really um, geared up to make sure that uh, happens on time, and uh, hopefully by April. Now, as I said, we're located right across from the new state museum, which just opened. And so if you're in Nashville and want to visit uh, that, when, when they reopen to the public, that is a definite must see. Um, now I will tell you, um, since COVID-19 happened, we do have a few restrictions currently um, in our uh, building. We reopened on May the 5th by appointment only. So if you're actually visiting the location, um, call ahead or email us. I will have that information on this, uh, the final slide of this presentation. You can even uh, uh, book a, a chat with us and online and, and we can schedule an appointment for you. And uh, of course, masks are, are mandatory at this time uh, on entry. 
for the safety of our uh, patrons and staff. And, uh, and we do limit the number of folks who, who are allowed in at this moment. Uh, and we're carefully monitoring health situation across the state and we're making sure that uh, when we do expand those uh, uh, hours and, or the opening, that we do so um, in consultation with our health officials and, and our public officials as well. And again, this is uh, sort of an overview of the Bicentennial Capitol Mall. So, um, such a beautiful place uh, to learn about Tennessee history. And when we have our building alongside the State Museum, uh, it'll be a real treat for you to visit. Now, I want to break into our online offerings because obviously you all are in um, uh, Nevada, at least some of most of you are, and, but some of you may not be. Uh, but you still would like to know how to use the uh, website. So I'm going to go into a little bit of our online resources. And so at the bottom of the screen, I have put in our web address. You can also Google Tennessee State Library and Archives, and it will take you right to our uh, website. The screenshot um, will give you um, kind of a look at what you'll see when you first log in. Now, I'd like to point out a couple of things before we get into some of the online resources. Uh, if you're first visiting us and you see one, two, three search boxes, that may be a bit confusing. And I will admit it is confusing. Um, I want to give you a little tip here. Um, this green search box that I'm pointing to searches the entire Secretary of State's divisions, and that includes us. We are a branch of the Secretary of State's office, and uh, that is a legislative branch. And so when you're searching for content on our website in the green box, you will be searching not only a library and archives, but also publications, elections, charitable, business services, etc. What you really want to do is focus on these two search engines. We have uh, an ability to search our online content. So Anything we've published on our website, you'll be able to search on that box. This catalog, however, is probably the more powerful research tool and more robust research tool. And uh, there you'll be able to search our book collection, uh, our uh, finding aids, um, our digital content is being migrated over there. And so um, this, this particular areas, uh, if you're just doing a keyword search, would be probably your first stop. Then also this link here, Library and Archives at the top, that'll be a pull down menu and you'll be able to uh, see what's in our website from that perspective. Now there, there's going to be um, a few online resources I'll highlight for you here. There's a, there's a whole host of material, but for time purposes, I'm, I've focused on these um, these online resources. We have a, a genealogy index, which I'll discuss. Um, Patriot Pass is a new program, um, real exciting. Uh, fan, our Family Bible Records Project. Our Tennessee Vir Virtual Archive, which I mentioned earlier, I'll get into a little bit more, uh, how that can be helpful to your research. Our Tennessee Electronic Library. And then our Supreme Court Case. So the genealogy index, this brings together over 1 million names appearing in Tennessee's most important historical records. And it's inspired by the way Ancestry and other online services have uh, organized their search uh, to be able to search multiple record groups from a single screen. The staff at the Library and Archives have been working with our uh, Information Technology Division over a two-year period to create this new resource for genealogists and researchers. Um, this index includes uh, sections on death records, military records, and general Tennessee research. And you can see on the table that I have highlighted here uh, a listing of the individual databases that you'll find in this index. The individual indexes were compiled uh, by the staff over many, many years, beginning in the late 1990s, and ultimately uh, led to the compilation of this one uh, stop shop for that information. 
Patriot Paths is uh, another project that we're really excited about, launched in July of last year. And uh, what this date, what this uh, site does is it's a, it uses GIS technology to map out the uh, travel patterns of our Revolutionary War veterans who um, re ultimately resided in the state of Tennessee. Thousands of veterans flooded into Tennessee at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, and about 2,000 pension files exist for those who came here. And since most of those soldiers were not eligible for a pension until they were in their 80s, a number who received a pension was relatively small compared to the number who served. Staff and interns at the Library and Archives poured over these pension files to find the dates and places where these soldiers were born, married, enlisted, and died. And the soldiers who had been born through the colonies and even in Europe ultimately made their way to Tennessee, they're also chronicled in this database. After the war, these men crossed the mountains from Virginia and North Carolina and some even came as far away as New York and Massachusetts. This map shows you a visual representation of all the, the names we've been able to document so far. And it almost looks like a, um, an aircraft, aircraft control uh, map in a way. But you'll be able to see geographically um, each individual person that traveled uh, to Tennessee uh, and served in the Revolutionary War. This is a work in progress. The data has been entered for about 1,200 of the pensioners so far out of the two, about 2,000. And so we're adding more entries uh, every day and we hope to complete that project very, very soon. Now the Family Bible Records Project is another online resource that's been years in the making. And um, just a, a note about this, before the 20th century, Tennessee and many other states did, didn't keep a comprehensive record of birth, marriage, and death records. Uh, families generally, if they did record uh, vital records, they did so in a family Bible, and that Bible was passed down through the generations. And so this uh, project seeks to document those genealogy records. And so, um, there are over 900 Bibles recorded in this collection and uh, about 26,000 surnames. And then we estimate that we need to add another 25,000 entries to complete the project. So again, this is like the Patriot Paths, a work in progress. I will say, however, since the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, one of the things that we have done uh, our staff have been uh, utilizing their time wisely by uh, adding to this collection. And so um, a lot of our public services staff have been working on um, making sure those additional 25,000 entries are added. And so we've made some significant progress in that amount uh, over the course of the pandemic. And uh, once we're, uh, once the data has been fully vetted and, and and proofread, we'll be able to upload that information and provide even more uh, uh, genealogy information through the Bible Records Project. Now, the Tennessee Virtual Archive, which I've mentioned, uh, is our digital repository of uh, our records. Uh, it includes more than 28,000 digitized items uh, from the Library and Archives, and we're adding more content every day. Uh, most of this is visual uh, in nature, and so uh, a lot of uh, photographs, a lot of maps, a lot of drawings, uh, but also documents and and audio and visual material. Um, you you can explore the collection by browsing um, different categories, or you can do a search, a keyword search of content. And you can even just, if you're 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 feeling um, rather adventurous, you can uh, view a random item. There's a button for that as well. Uh, these are this is a summary of all the collections. Um, 
not everything, but uh, it's a vast majority of what you'll find in the Tennessee Virtual Archive. One collection in particular I will highlight for you is called the Dr. Dr. Barbara Long um, Genealogical Files, uh, which document 33 different family lines stemming from East Tennessee to southwestern Alabama, and also with origins in Georgia, North and South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. And so these files contain original research notes, correspondence, interviews with family members, reports of professional genealogists, and copies of original records, including deeds, wills, land grants, business records, and even vital records. And so, um, although the Tennessee Virtual Archive is not the first place you might go looking for genealogy information, that collection uh, may hold promise for you. Another uh, aspect of our website I'll highlight is our Tennessee Electronic Library, with one caveat. Um, much of the material that is accessible is only accessible to Tennessee residents, so if you are accessing this through a computer that's not located in the state of Tennessee, some of the information that I'm sharing may not be available to you, but those who are, are visiting our website from Tennessee will be able to have full access to some of this material. But uh, some of it is available, and there's, I've pointed out the genealogy um, tab here on the electronic library, uh, where you'll have over four, access to over 400,000 electronic resources, including magazines, journals, podcasts, videos, ebooks, census records, primary source material. Um, there's about 1.2 million searches performed each month on 70 different TEL databases, um, so it's very uh, active uh, resource. And uh, here's a summary of what you might find in the Tennessee Electronic Library uh, in your genealogy research. That's to the Tennessean newspaper, that's the newspaper record here in Nashville. Um, Library of Congress's Chronicle of America. Uh, there's a link to that, the Digital Public Library, Heritage Quest, Tennessee Records found on Ancestry.com, and the Supreme Court case records. I will talk about. This is a, a real boon to the um, Supreme Court case files represent a period from about 1809 to 1950. And the volume of cases is quite extraordinary, with well over 10,000 boxes of material in storage. So the scope of the subjects discussed in the cases um, are very, very impressive and comprise the full range of criminal cases as well as land issues, debt and slavery and estate disputes, among many other disputes. And the content of the case files range from very brief records to a complete summary of all the proceedings, sometimes involving hundreds of pages. The transcriptions of trial testimony from the lower courts when they exist usually appear in cases. And within the cases, one can discover details that throw light on personal data, community life, family relationships. And it really makes this particular um, database a uh, valuable tool for genealogists. Um, I like to tell folks if you have a scoundrel in your family, it's actually pretty good because you probably have more information about them uh, through the court record than you would someone who's living the straight and narrow life. So this is uh, a great resource. And one thing you can do here that you really can't do anywhere else at the moment is order a copy online of any case that you see that is relevant to um, your research. I did a quick search on just the surname Smith to show you a screenshot example of what might you might find. And so if you see a case, for example, that has, um, say Edgar Smith is an a ancestor of yours, um, and you want to view that case file, you can order a copy online and we can scan that and deliver it to you, uh, usually in a PDF format, um, and you can also view it in, in person at the Library and Archive. 
Now, I've only scratched the surface of what we have to offer. And um, I, I want to briefly mention, I, I mentioned earlier our online catalog. We're, we're moving more and more online content to that resource every, every day. And so, again, if you are searching our, our website, this is a place you want to go, uh, as well as this link here. And so, um, I, if you're if you're visiting us, I can I can um, run through a demo if you like or answer any questions. Um, but this this is a great resource for you to uh, consult our collection. And as I said, books, archival research and finding aids, research resources, digital databases, and more are located in the catalog. So you can find it. It's searchable by field and by keyword and uh, quite a robust uh, search engine. And this is a rather long URL. I apologize for that. But uh, again, if you just Google the Tennessee State Library and Archives, go to our catalog, it'll take you right to it. Now, this is, I'm going to leave this slide up for just a bit. Uh, in case you are interested in jotting this information down. These are ha this is how you're going to be able to reach us. You can email us through ask at tsla.libanswers.com. You can phone us at 615-741-2764. And you can also chat with us during our regular business hours from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time, Tuesday through Saturday. There's a librarian usually on online who can um, chat with you and direct you to our information. We also have an Ask Us a Question page. Uh, I put the URL on the screen there, which has all that information. And as I said, um, May the 5th, we reopened after the COVID-19 on a limited basis by appointment only. And so if you happen to be in Nashville and you want to do some research, please call ahead because there are appointments. But the website is available to you 24-7, and uh, of course the email, phone, and chat are available during our regular business hours. And so with that, if, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, discuss that. Um, let me pull up the um, screen here, and um, let me know if you can see me here. If yeah, there's any questions. Gordon, Gordon, I think Pat had a question. If you scroll down in the chat box, you should see your mm -hmm. question right there. Okay, I see. Um, my husband has several ancestors from Hawkins and Macon County. Grandfather is Macon. Daughter born. Death and certificate. Yes. Well, I think uh, what I would probably uh, suggest is contacting our uh, librarians who are on staff to kind of help you determine what uh, specific resources we might have for that collection uh, and to answer that question. I don't have any immediate answers for that specific question, and and I would I would just caution you and. You know, we're not uh, in a position to do in-depth genealogy research, um, but we can direct you to specific collections that may help point you in the right direction. So I would email us at that uh, address, and um, we'll actually um, put that in the... Um, so this is the website you would need to go to to um, ask us a question. Um, and uh, our staff would be able to direct you to um, so some specific information. Uh, in cases like this, um, they moved to Kentucky. Um, you know, we may not have a lot of information there. The Macon County, Hawkins County records and microfilm might show some promise, so we could probably find some information there. We have on our website, um, let me go to. Gordon, offhand, do you know what year uh, Tennessee started holding, you know, actually creating vital records? 
That would be 1908, I believe. Um, we we really didn't start um, mandating vital records until the early 20th century. And so um, a lot of the earlier records are, it, it really depended on the county. And so um, some of the larger counties um, may have had a, uh, some records, but some of the smaller ones obviously would not. And so uh, you would be just kind of at the mercy of the county as to whether, whether they, um, they had a vital record pre-20th uh, century. Um, and so let me. Also have all the counties uh, in Tennessee put all of their old vital records into your collection? Um, we have um, most of the county records from about, um, um, of course, when they first started getting um, records until about the early or early to mid 90s when the microfilming program stopped. And so anything that the county might have uh, collected after the 1990s, uh, you would probably have to go to the county seat itself to view that material. But anything um, that's in their collection uh, that we microfilmed, it would, it would likely be in our microfilm collection. So uh, we do have our, on our website, and let me um, share my screen again. So I'll go to library and archives here and then history and genealogy. And then on the categories here, you can see uh, county and municipal records, county records. And so early county records, some of that's available on your library loan. Um, find um, order microfilm reels from here. So you have uh, lots of different ways where you can access this remotely. There's an inventory of county records on microfilm that you can access online. And so um, in Hawkins County, I'll just pull that one up. And this, this is um, our index to microfilm records in Hawkins County. You won't be able to see the actual record, but you can obviously see what we'll have in the dates, minute books. Um, go down here a little bit to criminal marriages. So, there's some early marriages here, pre-1900s. So this would be an area you'd want to kind of explore before, um, you know, beforehand. Um, these roll numbers are important to us to be able to determine um, what to look at if you're not in the building. And so if you're interested in seeing what's on that, um, reference the roll number. Now, Gordon, you talked about your online catalog. Um, can you talk a little bit to my class about search strategies, um, you know, different search strategies that might be, you know, more productive than others in your catalog? Sure. And I see another chat here from Louise. I'll, I'll briefly address that before I get into the, the online search strategies. Uh, she asks about our vertical file. Um, that Those vertical files will actually not be in part in the robotic retrieval system. We'll have them in a separate area of the new building. Staff can access them um, uh, a little more quickly. Um, most of the things that are going to be in the robotic, robotic arm um, wing of the U Library and Archives are state state records. Um, some of our um, less frequently used material, um, and 
Some of our more frequently used material, however, will be um, in areas of the building where we can have ready access to that. So I hope that answers that question. As far as search strategies go, back to the home page. I mentioned um, earlier when you visit our website, there you have three three different search engines. This green one, I would not I would bypass that completely because again, you're searching unless you just want to, you're searching the entire Secretary of State's office and you may get some search results that don't aren't relevant. Searching online content searches everything that uh, was published on this web site. Searching the catalog, however, will give you a little more uh, information. And so um, you can actually search here or you can visit our catalog by clicking that link. And then um, you can search and narrow your search by author, keyword, title subject. You can limit your search. Books only, microfilm, audiovisual, maps, or you can search everything. And um, I'm uh, uh, someone who likes John Sevier. I wrote a book about him, so I want to see what's in the collection about John Sevier and have Many, many resources dedicated to our state's first governor. Picture collection, photographs. If you solely want to look at books, do that with the pull down menu. You can even limit your search here with the publication date. So if I want to look at books that were published between 1988 and 2020, Please select an item. Oh, I'm going down here. And hey, there's my book. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? So, um, so there's a way to narrow down your search. Um, you can be if you're looking for authors. You can do that. Subjects as well. So the catalog is really a useful tool. Going back to the website, you just want to browse the online resources. The genealogy index is right there. Pulled up. By the way, here's how you access chat. So you can chat with a librarian there and ask a question in real time. Ask us a question page is right there. And email, our phone number, our chat. That you can also navigate the website going to the genealogy index. Some of the searches you can Search by last name. I did a last name F earlier. And here are some results from that search. Search counties if you want. So if you're looking for a Smith in a particular county, you can do that. You can focus on specific collections. And you can see here the number. Um, Smith occurs in your search, 92. So there are 92 Smiths here, and then you can drill down even further to a year. So if your Smith happens to be in 1905, drill down even further to May 1905. Alice Smith, death record. Now, if they were looking for the history of a particular surname, uh, let's say um, Harvey family, or you know something a little bit more um, unique than than Smith, 
Um, mm -hmm. Would you recommend that they go into the card catalog, uh, not you know the online catalog, and yes. type in the name of the family in, and then add the you know like let's say Harvey family, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or you know Johnson family or whatever the case may be. I would. Um, we we have a. You can go in here and and do subject. I get it. Genealogies, branches of American families of Harvey, Nesbitt, Dixon, Jameson. We do have a section of books in our collection that are solely dedicated to family histories. So you'll find uh, those in here. I don't know that the vertical files are in this particular catalog at the moment, but um, we do have a list of those. And that's a really kind of an, a, a collection of ephemera paper clippings, different articles, things that people have collected over time. Kind of a random, each each folder is kind of a random adventure, but um, the books here, um, there's Harvey Family. So we've got four different books with Harvey Family. And um, this is located in the center reading room. So obviously you're not going to be able to look at the book online, but um, if the book's available through interlibrary loan, you can certainly contact our interlibrary loan and acquire it there if, if it's available. The, the, the online catalog is really a, a great resource, kind of a, a catch-all for everything. Um, and the Bible records, I mentioned that earlier, and you can search or browse depending on you, uh, sticking with Harvey. We've got a few entries here. Look at uh, Dana Sue Harvey here. And there's a scan of the um, family Bible where that name is mentioned. And um, just doing a quick scan, I'm not seeing the name, but it's, it, it's there. Trust me, if it's in the database, it's there. But you can kind of see what, what to expect in the Bible records. There's Harvey. Harvey the that information now are you able once you pull up these Bible records um, are you able to download the Bible record I, I didn't see an option there to download it maybe I'm just not seeing it on the screen oh, oh there you, it is you can, I see it. you can do it through your browser and it is just download a PDF to your um, computer. yeah and Wonderful, wonderful. That that could be very, very, very helpful. Now, yeah, this, um, you, you talked at the beginning of your uh, presentation about the new building. What's going to, just out of curiosity, what's going to happen to the old building? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, our old building, as I mentioned, is on the National Register of Historic Places. And so um, that obviously means the building's not going away. So what, what happens to it once we vacate it? Well, um, we believe the state Supreme Court has eyes on the building and would like to occupy it and um, put courtrooms, uh, office space in there. They had, they had um, long desired that space when we originally uh, thought about moving in um, early 2000s. And uh, because of the economy, we weren't able to do it at that time. But um, and they had even drawn up some plans to uh, connect the two buildings. In the presentation, I, I showed you kind of an aerial view. Um, pull up here. This is the state Supreme Court building where my mouse is, and this is our building. 
they wanted to uh, build a connector between the two and utilize this space. I don't know if that's still in their plans, but um, something will occupy that building um, once we once we leave, because again, it's it's a historic structure, and um, you know it, it it has served our needs well, but it's obviously um, at a place now where it may be able to serve someone else's needs even better. That's that's what I think will happen. We will see. Is there is there a date projected? I mean, because obviously when you start moving your records, the archives will be closed for a certain period of time, correct? Yes. So our um, okay, I guess I'm back on. So um, our um, new projected um, timeline, when I, I I last heard, was that after the holidays, um, probably in January, uh, we will acquire uh, the keys to the new building. Uh, construction will largely be finished by that point, and then we can begin moving material. Uh, there, we're going to do our very level best to uh, make sure that we can remain open to a certain extent. Um, similar to what we've done during COVID-19, where we're offering online services. Um, but um, at some point, uh, some of those collections will not be able to access because they'll be in transit. But we want to limit that time as much as we can. So between January and April, we'll be moving materials in earnest. And then by April, we hope to be able to open to the public. So it's a tall order. It's we're moving um, just a mountain of material, but we're doing it in a very organized way. And so there's been a lot of planning uh, going on behind the scenes, lots of barcoding, lots of making sure um, what we have is is it's transferred in the right place and is available as soon as we're open. Okay, and then another one of the students has asked, if you chat with the librarian, you know, because the chat could, you know, be very beneficial for their uh, research needs, is there a way to save the chat? The chat, I think there's an option um, to save the chat at the end, and, um, and we have access to the chat transcripts um, that we can email uh, to you if you're not able to do that. So, um, so yes, if, if if, if that's something that they want, uh, we can certainly provide that. Wonderful. And then um, I have a question. You were talking about the vital records. Uh, is, is there like a, a, I'm sure every state has their own individual laws that govern what vital records are open after how long. Uh, so, you know, for birth, marriage, and death, uh, what, what is the law about when these records can be accessed? Sure. Well, um, there's a hundred and fifty year hundred and then a fifty year um, moratorium, and so um, your birth records are um, hundred years, your death records are fifty years. So um, we're in 2020. So 1920 is as recent as we're going to have in terms of your birth records. Um, your death records are are fifty years, and so um, anything more recent is going to be at the Office of Vital Records. And of course, if you want to access that, you're going to have to um, be able to prove that you, you're, you're a relative and um, make sure you show the proper ID and so forth. And so um, that's to protect identity, of course. But, um, but once, once you hit that, 100 year and 50 year threshold that those records automatically come to us and you'll be able to access. Wonderful, wonderful. Because I'm sure that's one of the things that they're, the class is going to be most interested in. Mm -hmm. um, now, you, you mentioned that you're working on digitizing the newspapers. Are you working with like um, Chronicling America or any other large organization to put them in like a central place or are you going to keep them on your website as they're digitized and make those accessible to everybody no matter where they are in the world? Well, specifically in Tennessee, 
the University of Tennessee Knoxville has a program where they're partnering with the Library of Congress on Chronicling America. So um, that's not us directly, but uh, what we do, um, we have partnered with a, a few organizations. Um, we're obviously partnering with Ancestry on making sure some of our records are available there. Uh, but we've also engaged in partnerships with uh, folks in Chattanooga. So um, uh, there's some newspaper efforts to digitize some newspapers in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and um, where we're able to uh, forge those partnerships and, and obviously make sure we're, we're honoring copyright. Um, we, we try and do that. But the bulk of the bulk of the statewide activity for as far as newspaper digitization, I believe, is, is run through the University of Knox, University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, I wanted to let the class know, I, you know, probably many people in my class have never seen a robotic retrieval system before. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out uh, that the our local university, the uh, University of Nevada at Reno, uh, their library has a electronic uh, a robotic retrieval system, and they have actually a window uh, on that whole wall that allows you to actually sit there and watch the robot retrieve. Uh, so, so I would encourage anybody who's interested in, in actually viewing in person a robotic retrieval system in, in the actual, you know, as it works. It's actually a very fascinating thing to watch, um, how the robot goes up and down the aisles and retrieves the items. Uh, so I would encourage my class, you know, as soon as the COVID crisis is over, uh, that they can go right over to the University of Nevada Reno Library uh, right there on campus and uh, actually watch it. it it's I was fascinated. Uh, I, I went there about a year and a half ago and watched the retrieval system, and it is just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we'll have something similar in our building. I, I threw up the slide here since we're talking about it um, in the new building. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but this is sort of a circling here, a, a footprint of our building. and. Um, there, I, I believe there are plans to put somewhere up here um, places where you can actually view the ASRS in action too. So we're 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 planning something very similar uh, in our building. It'll be real exciting to see it all come together. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so I'll let the class know uh, that if you have any last questions, uh, to please put them in the chat box. And we'll wait a few moments uh, to see if anyone's going to go ahead and ask any further questions. In the meantime, Gordon, I want to let you know that um, one of your colleagues, Melissa Barker, uh, she wanted yeah. me to say hello and send her regards. Uh, she's oh, been wonderful. our guest. She's been our guest speaker twice before, and she's scheduled again. I believe it's in October uh, mm -hmm. to do a third presentation for my class. And so, you know, I just wanted to pass that on. I talked to her this morning through email. And mm -hmm. she was thrilled when she saw your name on the upcoming guest list, and she just wanted me to pass that along. Well, that's very kind. We love Melissa down here. She's uh, delivered talks for us in the past for our workshop series, uh, very knowledgeable in what she does, and a uh, very engaging presenter, and uh, really, uh, really glad to know her, and uh, glad she was able to connect with you guys, too. Yeah, I have a feeling that question that one of my class uh, students asked about the vertical files, that's probably the result of her presentation because she yeah. did a wonderful presentation to us about, uh, you know, vertical files and archives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it doesn't look like the class has any further questions. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, say thank you very much, Gordon, and thank you very much for letting us record this today as well. And for the students' benefit, I'll let them know that this will be available next week on the TMCC College uh, YouTube channel. And I'll be sending that link to you, Gordon, as well, along with a thank you note next week. And uh, as you can see, uh, my students are saying thank you uh, on the chat room. They've learned so much, thank you. And uh, I'll let the students know before uh, Gordon signs off that if you would like to stay online here in the uh, in the uh, Blue Jeans meeting room, um, I will be here uh, for the next uh, hour or two. Uh, and if you have any research questions that you'd like to work with me one-on-one -on -one with, uh, just stay online, don't sign off. 
And then for all the other people who are ready to sign off, just click on that red hang up button and you'll be disconnected. So with that, Gordon, thank you very, very much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that and I know my class did as well. I'm looking at all the comments that are coming in right now. And okay. um, I hope that all of my students, if they're down in Tennessee, get a chance to, to uh, stop and visit your new facility. In the meantime, I encourage all my students to reach out to your librarians there in Tennessee and uh, work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this information with you.